Hello, I'm Dr. Wells Stewart, an orthopedic surgeon specializing in hip and knee replacement with Ortho Virginia here in Richmond, Virginia. Thanks for tuning into our Facebook Live event today. Uh, today, I just want to take the opportunity to talk about a couple of things that are newer advancements and technologies or techniques in hip and knee replacement that I think are expediting patient recovery and can really just help us improve outcomes for these two surgeries. It's 2024. We're in it technologically driven world where everything we do has been touched and affected by technology and hip and knee replacement should be no different. If it's if we're doing things the exact same way we were doing 30 years ago, then we're not trying to evolve or change. And so, you know, I just want to highlight a couple of things, one each for hip and one for knee, just talking about some of the newer things we're doing. We'll start with the hip. Hip replacement is arguably the most successful surgery in modern medicine at restoring patients, quality of life and functional outcomes. How do we improve on that? I mean, that's a pretty high bar. Um, a lot of the focus to this point has been on surgical approach, direct anterior, posterior, or a variety of approaches in between. The direct anterior approach has been marketed a lot, with a lot of patients as the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm a direct anterior surgeon, so I, you know, I'm a fan of it. Um, but the reality is, is that a well done hip replacement is a well done hip uh, long term. Everybody does great. There is evidence that suggests that direct anterior is going to speed up recovery timeline, usually in the terms of time on a walker less, usually a couple of days to even a week. You know, to our cold calculating doctor brains, a week doesn't seem like a very long time. But when you're the patient, you're the person who's had the surgery, you're, you're the one in pain, you're the one dealing with it, a week is a long time. And so I think surgical approach is important here. But I think even with direct anterior, we have newer you know really on the on the hip stem side and the way we're putting things in we have a newer techniques that i think are even pushing that recovery timeline even faster in the early days of direct anterior hip really we were taking hip stems that were designed to be put in from a posterior approach and we were trying to just put them in from the front the anatomy and the geometry of those two are very different it's like taking a square peg and trying to put it around hole you know, on a, when you're doing a posterior hip, you've got this straight shot down the femur and it's really easy to just go in and out very conveniently. From the front, that's not the same. And so, you know, really what that resulted in were some higher complication rates with direct anterior hips. Fracture, where we break the bone at the time of surgery, that's not good. Um, another complication was putting in stems that were undersized, they were too small. So they had higher failure rates long-term. The stem never grew on because it wasn't put in big enough because they couldn't get the access they needed to. In order to avoid doing those two complications, one of the ways you can do that is by stripping more soft tissue, cutting more things off the proximal femur. Well, when you do that, one, you, you set yourself up to maybe self up to maybe have instability. And two, you, uh, you are now cutting more things. The more things you have to cut and move out of the way, the more pain you're going to have post-operatively with your patients. It wasn't really until about 2018 when the first true major direct anterior friendly hip stem hit the market and not just the stem but the whole implementation of things to put in with it these modern you know nowadays all the major companies have a, a similar model but these new design hip stems really what they do is they're designed to be put in from the front which you know so they you know this is one in my hand that i'm holding here and so they one they're shorter we don't have to get us access straight shot down two they've got these lateral reliefs that allow us to help uh to, to put them in because we have to kind of make a curve. They have a medial specific curvature where we can really wrap that cow car. Things that are gonna give us a good, well-fit, well-sized stem from the front without having to strip a bunch of soft tissues to, to put them in. We can be so much more minimally invasive with these newer stems putting them in uh, than we could, you know, even, you know, like I said, six years ago. Um, so I think that really just speeds up the recovery process. I think nowadays in 2024, it's very common for patients to be off a walker in less than a week after a primary direct anterior hip. And I think a big part of that is our instrumentation has just gotten better. Okay, moving on to the knee. If hip replacement has been a home run, knee replacement has been much tougher at bat for us as, as hip and knee surgeons. We know that across the board, patients, you know, depending on what you read, I guess, uh, but somewhere between five and up to 20% of patients don't love their knee replacement. That number's too high, but it's been that way for 
20 or 30 years even. You know, I think we, we've tried different things to change, but fundamentally we've been doing knee replacement the same way for the past 30 years too. So I don't know how we could expect it to really change if we're doing the same thing over time. In traditional knee replacement, really what we're doing is we're, we're looking at a knee and we're doing it based on averages, on the average person. In a traditional knee replacement, we take a rod, we put it up the femoral canal, we then use that to take a preset amount of bone, it's the same with everybody, and we do that at a preset angle that's the same for everybody, based off an average. We cut that bone off, then we take another jig for a rotation. Again, we set that based off an average, off the average person, not that knee. We make four cuts, taking the same amount of bone for everybody. And so then we move to the tibia, we put an external a clamp around the ankle. It doesn't matter if that ankle's skinny ankle or a chubby ankle. Then we kind of set our alignment. We kind of, you know, one of these to look at and say, okay, that looks about right. And then we take a preset amount of bone and cut it. At that point, we've made all our bone cuts and we've done nothing that was customized really to that knee. And if that sometimes you got a good feeling knee at that point. Other times you got to start doing what we call releases where you gotta start cutting soft tissues because it's not quite, well, we have, it doesn't have the balance that we want. We want a knee that's going to be a nice hinge that rotates smoothly um, and isn't just clapping around like a maraca. And so, you know, you can see how that's a problem where we're just making all the cuts the same and then, and then dealing with it afterwards. The more things you have to cut, the more patients going to hurt. Compare that to a modern system where with robotic assisted knee replacement and specifically I'm going to talk about the Mako robot. Uh, the, the Mako um, is a CT based robotic assisted system that gives us a whole new way of doing knee replacement. In Mako, we have a CT scan ahead of time. So there's a, you have a three dimensional image of the bones. We know exactly where those bones are in space. We know what they look like. We know any bone spurs they have, any bone defects they have. We know the size of the implant before we start the case. But we can use all that information and take it into, into account during the surgery as well. Because we have that CT scan, that's why I point out Mako, there are some other robotic systems that aren't CT based, but without CT, you don't have that three-dimensional accuracy. But we can be, we're sub-millimeter, less than a millimeter of accuracy, you know, to that exact, less than a degree exact because of, you know, because of the CT scan. And so at the time of surgery, before we make any cuts, we are assessing the ligaments, the, where the knee is tight, where the knee is loose. Hey, because of that, we can now say, well, let's shift this implant a millimeter here, a degree there, up or down, and do that to maximize the position of our implants, again, before we ever cut the bone, to minimize the soft tissue tension that we or the soft tissue release that we need to do after the after we've made our cuts. So this just helps us give that knee what it needs instead of what the average knee needs. You know, it's just a better way to do a knee. In, I mean, you can still have a great knee replacement that's done the traditional method, but the discrepancy on outcomes is gonna be broader because again, those are based on averages. Mako helps us just customize what we do to that knee on that day and that patient. The analogy I like to use is compare it to a, a road trip in 2005 versus today. In 2005, you had your flip phone and you maybe printed out some map quest directions. Maybe you just pulled out the map of the Eastern United States and you looked at, all right, here's A, here's B, found your route to go and you started driving. You didn't know where traffic was. You didn't know what roads were closed because of construction. There was an accident up ahead. You didn't know about it. You just, you thought, oh, I'll get there somewhere between three and four hours from now or however far you're going. Compare that to today. You got your iPhone, you punch into Google Maps where you're going. It tells you exactly how long, the fastest way to go and exactly when you're going to get there. It tells you where there's construction, where there are delays. It's avoiding those things in real time while you're driving. If there's an accident up ahead that causes a major slowdown, it's going to redirect you and say, hey, don't go that way. Go this way. It's going to save you time. It'll tell you where there's a traffic, uh, you know, speed check up ahead so you can slow down so you don't get a speeding ticket and have the, he the headache fall with that. That's what Mako does for knee replacement. It's giving us real time data as we go through and do the knee and say, hey, don't go this way. If you go down this path, you're going to end up with something you don't like. Do this instead. And that information is so powerful. Now, you got to know how to use it as a surgeon and to really incorporate it. But what it does is it just lets us do a better knee in a more soft tissue friendly manner that's specific to that patient. And I think 
you know, it's, it's 2024. It's not 2004. We've got to be improving and trying to strive to do things better than we were back then. Last thing I'll say about knee replacement, a knee replacement is a knee replacement. We still have to move muscles out of the way and we still have to cut bone. It's going to hurt. Anybody who promises you a pain-free knee replacement, it's probably the same type of person who would try to sell you some oceanfront property in Arizona. It's something, you know, there's going to be pain involved. But by using modern technologies like Mako, we can do a better job, be more soft tissue friendly, and do these surgeries in a way that is going to minimize your pain, expedite your recovery, and most importantly, give you a great long-term knee that's going to last you, you know, forever. So that's about all I have for for today, but I guess we can open it up to questions at this point. Thank you, all right. for doing that. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. We do have some questions. So our first one is, how do you know when it is time for a replacement? Yeah, it's a good question. So what I tell patients is you have to have bone on bone arthritis for a knee replacement. So that, you know, you know, we needed some radiographic evidence of that, but let's say you got a bad knee or bad hip. The things that I tell you are you need to have pain either all day, every day that's really bothering you, or you need to have enough pain during the, that it's affecting your quality of life because it's preventing you from doing the things you want to do. If you are a golfer and you can't get out, the thought of going out and playing 18 holes, you're like dreading because your knee hurts so bad. It's time to consider knee replacement. If you're a pickleball player, a tennis player, and you know you can't do the things you love because of joint pain, we can fix that. Um, we're not gonna make you 18 again, but we can make it a lot better and get it, you can get back to being active. If you're a hiker, and you, you know, the thought of a five mile hike, you're like, nope, can't do it. Um, you know, that's when it's time to consider knee replacement. It doesn't have to be 24 seven around the clock pain. It has to be pain that's preventing you from having the quality of life that you want to have. Thank you. The next question is, what is the recovery time after a hip replacement or after a knee replacement? Yeah, recovery time is going to vary depending, you know, on patient outcomes or patient factors going into it. But generally, I, I tell my hips that you go on the same day, you'll be on a walker for a week or two. Most of my patients, I'd say over 90%, show up at their two-week visit, no cane, no walker, walking quite well. A lot of them tell me they're off the walker in three to five days after surgery. You're sore, you know, they say it's a different type of pain. It's a slow, steady improvement. You're through the first six weeks. After six weeks, you know, you're building up from there. You gotta get the strength and endurance back, but the pain goes away relatively quickly in a hip replacement, considering what we have to do to you. Knee replacement, you still, a lot of my patients go on the same day. Most of them do. The first two weeks are tough. That's just, you know, it hurts. Um, it is what it is. We give you pain medicine. Most of my patients, you know, a lot of, around the house at two weeks are not using a cane or a walker, but outside the house still using a, a walker. Um, just, you know, because it hurts. Uh, but by week six, most of my patients hurt less than before surgery. So you take recovery long term is a individualized thing. If your goal is to be back on the tennis courts, that's going to take longer. That's a higher functional level to get to. If your goal is to walk around the neighborhood, walk your dog and garden, you're gonna, three months, you're gonna feel pretty good doing that. Thank you. Is there physical therapy after a hip replacement or a knee replacement? And if there is, how long do you do it for? Yeah, good question. There absolutely is physical therapy involved with both. With the hip, physical therapy, quite honestly, is not as important. Um, there's plenty of centers that don't do formal PT for their hip replacements. Um, Typically, patients will do it through the first six weeks, though, here at Ortho Virginia. And then with knee replacement, the first two weeks, I, I personally don't stress therapy as much. We have therapy, see them and work with them. You're going to make more of your recovery in the first six weeks. My goal for my patients if it was a week six is to have range of motion of zero to about 115, 120 degrees of motion. Um, and you know that that you're doing that a couple of times. Really, you're doing your home exercises every day by yourself, and then you're meeting with a the therapist two or three times a week. Thank you. How long does a modern replacement last? Will you have to get it replaced again in the future? Good question. The lifespan uh, on the hip, um, 
you know, realistically, we're looking at over 30 years. The the modern plastic, there used to be the rate limiting step was the plastic. I mean, it would wear down, you know, 10, 15 years. Modern plastics came out around 2010, a little before then. And granted, none of those new plastics have been in for 30 years, but the wear studies in the lab suggest we're not seeing the wear problems that we had with those. And so we think these should be 30 years. All comers, hit, you know, for infection, dislocation, otherwise you, you look at these have failed 1% per year. So in 25 years, 75% of them will still be in. Um, knee replacement, same thing. You know, the, the ways it can fail used to be the plastic. We think we've solved that. Um, one thing in knee replacement that's newer is press fit technology. The, the idea being that the bone grows onto the metal um, like it does in the hip. And so that will allow it to theoretically never loosen. Um, that's a relatively newer technology. That's again, assisted made, I think better by where Mako comes in because you can make your cuts exact and perfect. You need perfect cuts to press fit a knee and that helps us do that. So um, not every patient is a candidate for press fit knee just based on bone quality, but that can, that can eliminate that variable um, with on growth. And we're seeing really good outcomes in data with press fit technology with, with again, with modern implants. Thank you. What can patients do before the surgery to make their recovery better? Is there physical therapy or exercises that they can do ahead of time? You can do what's called prehab, where you work on strengthening around the, the knee or, or the hip before surgery. To be honest, most of my patients show up already kind of ready to to sign up and, and go to surgery. And so it the reality is with with arthritis, it's a mechanical problem. You've got a bone on bone knee that's just just not bending. And so uh, we need to fix that mechanical problem. A hip, we got a bone on bone hip. We need to we need to fix that problem, that mechanical block to motion. So um, it's definitely not mandatory to do prehab. And I'd say the majority of my patients do not do formal prehab. Thank you. If you need both a knee replacement and a hip replacement, which one should come first? In the setting, unless someone's got severe deformity, I generally recommend you do the hip first. A um, couple of reasons are hip arthritis, it, I just feel like it's more debilitating to patients than knee arthritis. I think it, people with a bad hip, it really just affects their quality of life a lot more than a bad knee. And so for that reason alone, I say do the hip first um, and then we come back for the knee. Now, in some patients, if you have a really you know severe knee, then I recommend the other way around. But I also just tell the patient, what hurts you more? What bothers you more? And let's do that one first. Thank you. Are there age limits for the replacement surgeries? Can you be too old or too young for it? In terms of age limits, we'll start on the old side. Age is just a number. There are 85 year olds who look and are healthier. They look better and they're healthier than 65 year olds. So it is, you know, once you start getting above the age of 80, we know that, you know, it's not as common to do hip and knee replacements electively. In those patients, but certainly do them um, in, in patients who are otherwise healthy and fit enough to do it. Um, you know, 85, even 86, is, it's just, again, age is just a number. It's about a, a physiologic strength and your overall health. Um, on the younger side, generally it's better to, we know, generally we know a couple things. Younger patients don't love knee replacements as much as old, older patients doesn't feel as natural, they demand more from it. And so we know they have lower satisfaction scores with joint replacement than than older folks do. And so I try to have this talk with patients, certainly, you know, even in your 50s is young to have a joint replacement. It's, it's, I think with modern implants, if we can get 30 years out of these, I think it's very acceptable to do joint replacement in those patients, provided they've done everything they can up to that point. Um, and they have true significant disease. On the on the hip, there are a few, sometimes even very young patients who have severe hip problems and their quality of life is just so impacted that we, you know, it's, I think in modern times, it, it, it used to be more, more controversial, but now, you know, we say the hip replacement has got a great track record for longevity. And so we're not as gun shy about doing those and those, you know, if we can give them 30 years of great quality of life and we might have to revise it in the future, 
most patients will take that because quality of life is important. Thank you. What types of pain relief are used after surgery? So in terms of managing pain post-op, first thing at the time of surgery, we do, you know, uh, our anesthesia providers provide pain blocks and we put some local anesthetics around the hip or the knee to help with pain. After surgery, I think it's important that we take a multimodal approach. What that means is we have all different types of pain medicines available to us. So Tylenol, that's one of the pain class, pain medicine classes. I like patients on a lot of Tylenol. Anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs are in patients who can use them if, you know, for if their kidneys are okay, if they're not on blood thinners, uh, anti-inflammatories, I like a patient on those. Steroids, right at the time of surgery, you get a dose of steroids at, right at surgery. And you also, I give my patients another dose of steroids a few hours after surgery. Studies have shown good decreased opioid use if we do that. Um, opioids, medicines like oxycodone, hydrocodone, tramadol, one of those, I, I have them available to patients. Most patients need them to some degree. The hips really won't use them nearly as much as the knees, but and so every now and then you have patients who say, oh, I didn't take any pain pills and that's totally fine, but everybody is different. On average, I would expect patients to use some opioids. And so every surgeon is gonna have a different one they prefer. My, I typically prescribe oxycodone to my younger patients and tramadol to my older patients once they're over 75, just because they tend to not need the oxy to feel strong for them. Another thing that's kind of newer too is uh, there's newer studies going on looking at oral transexemic acid after surgery for a couple of days. That's an anti-inflammatory that is helped improve some outcomes and wanted to, there was a big paper published on that at uh AUKUS last year that won an award so looking at all the different ways we can help with pain we we, we do them thank you are there activities that you can't do after a hip replacement or other activities you can't do after a knee replacement some common questions are about things like horseback riding swimming skiing running pickleball things like that the Thing that I on hip replacement, the thing I like to say, I jokingly quipped that Bo Jackson had a home run in the major leagues with a hip replacement. I don't put any formal restrictions on my patients after total hip replacement. Um, the, you know, the, no formal hip precautions, even. The in the first six weeks, I ask that you not do jumping jacks, jump off the bed of a truck, jump off a patio, anything like that. Um, and most patients don't feel like doing that stuff, but uh, you get the point. You can you'll build up your activities, you get further out from surgery. Long term, though, you can return to. I got plenty of patients who are horseback riders, especially here in Virginia. We got a lot of that. Um, pickleball players, tennis, but you can do long term, you can do whatever you want to do on a hip replacement. The, the hip does need to on grow. And so the, that's why I say those first six to eight weeks, we need you to, you can walk and stuff. But let's not do any strong axial loading activities. The replacement, you can do whatever you want to on. Um, you know, most of my patients are not long distance runners. I do have. I think of one gentleman it's specifically who big time runner and uh, he's going to run and he told me he's going to run and you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, and he does. Um, but most of my patients are not long distance runners. These are mechanical parts we're putting in. Theoretically, you could wear it down faster, cause issues by unnecessary miles. But I, I think that's a more of a theoretical. Um, yeah. Returning to golf, pickleball, tennis, whatever it is you want to do. Very reasonable. Um, again, you're not going to be 18, um, but you should be able to get back to it with less pain than you had before surgery. And then the other thing I was kneeling down on a knee replacement, you can do it. A lot of patients don't love it. Patients who are plumbers or electricians, guys who have to get down on these, they can train themselves to do it with knee, with knee pads, but that's generally not comfortable. It's the one thing that consistently patients like, ah, I don't love doing that. Thank you. How will the new less invasive hip replacement that you held up and showed work if it is used um, as a revision for someone who already had the larger old style replacement? Yeah, so we 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 can't use something like this in a revision setting, or we shouldn't use in a in that setting where we're going to something like this. With you know, if we're revising things, we have to go longer. We have to go into the diaphysis of the bone, which is the, the more the shaft instead of the diaphysis. So that's not, you know, that these test style stems don't really come into play in revision. Um, you can still do revisions from the front, um, but uh, revision is a whole different ball game. Uh, with a, a, you know, if we're going in there, there's a problem. We've we're got our hand forced to fix, and so we're going to take care of it. But uh, we're not as 
you know, unfortunately, we can't be as uh, slick and minimally invasive with a with a revision. Thank you. Is it better to replace both knees at the same time or to do them individually? The short answer to that is that most studies suggest it's a not a great idea to do both knees at the same time. Just higher complication profile across the board, whether that's blood clots, infection, stiffness, stuff like that. I don't think it's a major problem to do both knees at the same time in provided the patient is otherwise a good candidate. Um, and then sometimes in patients with bilateral severe deformity, I think that's when the only time you would really strongly consider it. Recovery, it's certainly doable. You, you know, the recovery is probably, you know, probably at least twice as hard to do them at the same time. Generally, I recommend not doing them at the same time. I'm willing to if it's really important to the patient and that they are otherwise optimized. It, you know, as a patient who are on, you know, if, if, you know, a bigger patient or a less healthy patient, I'm not going to offer you a bilateral knee replacement because this, the evidence says you have a better chance of something bad happening to you. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, not much for risk, but you can do it at the same time. Um, but I think our patient selection needs to be very important there. Thank you. How long after a replacement, especially on the right leg, before you can drive yourself? Good question. Yeah, the right leg being the important thing here is again, most everybody has an automatic transmission now, so not really an issue on the left. Um, I will say even with the left, if you're popping opioids, you shouldn't get behind, you shouldn't drink and drive, you shouldn't, you know, pop a pill and drive. But um, on the hip th side, a lot of my patients are ready to drive. I, or I'll back up one step. There's no hard and fast answer. There's no legal definition of when can someone, re someone can return to drive. It has to be ultimately up to the patient and their comfort level. Do they honestly feel that they could step on the brake adequate time if they needed to, uh, to stop from having an accident? Uh, the hip replacement, a lot of my patients are already driving well before their six week visit. Um, yeah, so I think somewhere in the four week range, you know, four to six weeks is, is a reasonable timeline to start driving, but ultimately it comes down to the comfort level of the patient. Right knee, you, you know, most people probably don't drive during the first six weeks. I generally recommend not doing it unless you're really out of the game. And again, your comfort level, you're really, you've got good reaction time and you've got to be honest with yourself. No legal definition of it though. Thank you. If somebody lives by themselves, will they need someone else to come stay with them to help after they get a hip or a knee replacement? Or they will they be able to go home and keep living alone? I hear this question a lot because it's pretty common. And I think a lot of patients are surprised by how functional they are right away, especially on the hip side. Uh, you know, going in, you know, so typically having somebody around, you don't have to, you definitely don't need 24 seven support in the house. It, it, some of this is also depending on your preoperative functional status. Patients who are, you know, maybe less mobile before surgery, they're going to take long, you know, they might need more help, but uh, it's nice to have someone who, if they can stay with you the first night or two, or at least be available by phone call to help them. But it is not a requirement to have somebody there 24 seven. I, I think a lot of my patients are surprised by how quickly they're, you know, you, you're not going to leave until you can get from the bed to the bathroom, you practice stairs, you practice getting out of the car, you practice all these things. It's not, I'm not saying it's the easiest thing in the world, but you're, you're sore, but you can, you certainly can manage. Thank you. If someone has bone on bone arthritis in their knee, but the pain is tolerable, are they causing more damage by not getting it taken care of or should they wait until the pain uh, is at a higher level before they get a replacement. Once your knee's bone on bone, with a few exceptions, is it's, it's already as bad as it's going to get theoretically. I mean, it's already severe to that point. So no, you're not really making my job as a surgeon any harder by waiting. Now, if you're starting to have severely restricted motion, but it doesn't hurt that bad, but you can't move your knee but 20 or 30 degrees, that's a different story. Um, but most people are not going to wear down their knee enough to where the surgery itself changes anything. So no, I tell patients, even with bone on bone arthritis, that if your pain isn't bad enough that it's impairing your quality of life, we shouldn't be doing this surgery. Even though it's a great surgery and has good outcomes and a very, you know, 
you know, very good risk profile, nothing in life is 100%. So you need to be, make sure that you're mentally ready and this is what you want. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. That is all the time that we have for today. You can make an appointment with Dr. Stewart by going to orthovirginia.com. Dr. Stewart, would you like to close? No, that, that's it. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Great questions. And uh, yeah, just come see us at Ortho Virginia whenever. We're happy to get you taken care of. Take care. Mm -hmm.